Hello, I'm Rhoda Weiss, co-chair of the Speckers Conference and a national healthcare consultant. It's an honor today to have as our keynote, Sister Mary Haddad, the president and CEO of the Catholic Health Association, a position she's held since July, 2019. During her career, she's served on Sister of Mercy leadership teams in health, social service, and education, including service in Belize, Central America, and the West Indies. We're really excited that recently Pope Francis appointed Sister Mary a member of the Vatican Program for Promoting Integral Human Development that focuses on healthcare, immigration, charitable works, and climate change to promote well being and flourish of the human family worldwide. CHA includes 600 hospitals, 1,600 long-term care facilities and community health centers in all states and represents the nation's largest group of nonprofit healthcare providers caring for one out of every seven patients in the U.S. Welcome, Sister Mary. Thank you, Rhoda. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon, virtually. It's thrilling for, for all of us who are listening and watching. Sister, almost three-fourths of your leadership at CHA has been during the pandemic. While we've all faced crises, this one has been daily going on day after day after day for a year and a half. What have been some of the biggest learnings for you as a new CEO and other Catholic healthcare leaders over the past year? Well, um, it, it has been a, quite a trip, uh, certainly for everybody, but coming in as a new CEO, um, I thought um, the best thing I could do for the organization is learn how to be agile. And I think as we all did, um, pivot, respond to needs. Um, I have a social work training, so I think I looked back on that and, and certainly um, was able to um, read the signs of the time, see what we needed to do, um, how we needed to respond in support of our members. But, you know, I, I think looking at the bigger picture of this, um, there's been so much that we have learned. Um, this is a, a global health crisis. And I think um, to start with that, we've learned that uh, we're connected to each other, not only here in this country, but globally. And what happens in another country is eventually going to impact us in this country. And therefore, you know, it, it is our call to look, um, I think, more seriously about the work we do in global health. And uh, thank you for acknowledging the service on uh, the Vatican office, the dicastery. I think it will give an opportunity for us to bring Catholic healthcare in the United States to that conversation and also to learn more globally what we can do. You know, over and over again, we've been hearing about what has COVID revealed to us, and, and I don't have to, you know, start the laundry list of that, but um, so much of the agenda that is coming out of COVID really are things that we knew pre-COVID. And I think it um, had, you know, shine a bright light on it, and it certainly gave us the will to act in looking at um, health inequities, um, mental health issues, needs around long-term care. And um, I think one of the things that as a leader, also in an organization that I've looked at is care for our employees. Um, CHA is a small organization, about you know, 70 plus employees, and I've seen the impact on them. And they have done phenomenal work in, in um, you know, shifting into a remote work setting and be able to support our members. But we're only a small microcosm of the bigger reality. And for those who have been on the front line day in and day out, um, you know, I think I've learned that we have to be attentive to our own care providers. And I was flying the other day, and of course, you know, as they're getting ready to take off, they're telling everyone who have children, you know, please make sure that your mask is in place before you help the child. And in many ways, it's the same. We have to care for our care providers if they're going to be able to care for our patients. And so I think that's one of the um, great learnings that I have taken away from this as well. Thank you, sister. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, how have your members changed the way they deliver care as a result of the pandemic? As with others across the healthcare industry, telehealth is certainly, um, you know, came into the forefront. We had been working in programs around telehealth. I know here in St. Louis, we had um, an EICU in um, Avera Health has done a tremendous job in their work in looking at um, utilizing telehealth to meet, you know, the needs of the rural communities. 
but it didn't get the traction it got until we were all, you know, relegated to our homes and and not able to come out basically to, um, you know, shelter in place, if you will. And uh, we saw the importance of having telehealth. I think also we've seen, um, you know, the increase of collaboration. It's very important. Uh, early on in the pandemic, I had been on the phone with all our system CEOs and talking with them pretty regularly about what are the issues, what do we need to do, and was able to help facilitate some networking. And um, our CEOs were very engaged in saying, how can we help each other through this? Um, not only among Catholic ministries, but I also saw it an example here in St. Louis um, we came together, uh, two Catholic systems, SSM, Mercy, and uh, BJC Health System here in St. Louis, and formed a COVID-19 task force. And a physician um, led that, a physician from SSM led that charge. And it was a beautiful way of um, seeing how known competitors basically come together in a time of need and say, we're better off doing this together. And so I think that collaboration was another real strong learning. Back to uh, uh, our care providers, that's another thing that I saw um, our health ministries really elevating the care and looking at providing supportive services for their well-being. So we have uh, pastoral care and chaplains that are available within our facilities to serve our patients. We started to see our health ministries designating these individuals to serve our staff. Um, you know, day in and day out, the levels of anxiety and stress for themselves as well as their families and loved ones when they would go home in the evening. So um, we at CHA were able to pull together a number of resources on uh, well-being and put them on our website. We also um, have put together a well-being task force and saying, you know, um, how we can continue this into the future. And I think the last thing I would say about that, our um, recognition of the elevation of looking at community health became very important as we started seeing so many of the social conditions that had a direct impact on people's health during COVID, particularly, um, you know, housing being one, you know, when people were asked to stay inside and if you're homeless, how can you stay safe? And so we recognize that um, community health, something we've been talking about for a long time as we look at social determinants, um, became much more prominent during COVID. Thank you, thanks so much. A big focus currently among government and, and among our healthcare organizations is getting the public to accept the vaccine. How has CHA used its voice to ensure vaccine acceptance and counter vaccine hesitancy, resistance, and especially misinformation? Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, I have to say um, early on uh, in the pandemic, um, uh, Brian Reardon, whom you know, um, and at our association, Heads Up Communication and Marketing, he and his team really came up with a creative um, tagline about Love Thy Neighbor. And so we started a social media campaign on Love Thy Neighbor and really um, trying to encourage mask wearing, also social distancing, encouraging people to do their part. And we use that tagline because we really wanted to send the message, it's about our care for another. It's just not about us. When people say, I don't need to do this because I'm not gonna get sick or I'm not worried about myself. It isn't about yourself. It's about your possibility of infecting someone else. And so we started early with that. And then we were pleased that so many people joined us. Um, it was a catchy tagline, and it certainly, um, you know, uh, caught the attention of a lot of people. So we continued that with vaccines uh, when we started looking at the vaccine distribution. And I was pleased to say we were also invited to join a lot of other coalitions. One that I first was involved with and some of our team was an interfaith group. Because um, even with the past administration and the Trump administration, we recognized that um, you know, people were more than resist, uh, excuse me, hesitant. They were becoming resistant to vaccines. And so what can we do to, um, you know, uh, mitigate those, you know, attitudes and, and, and uh, resistance to, to receiving the vaccine? So felt that faith leaders would have a particular role to play in this. 
Um, we assume that people have confidence and trust in their, you know, pastor, you know, um, and their faith leader, their, you know, whoever it is. And so the, um, uh, the Biden administration then gathered, um, you know, the um, faith leaders across the country and said, can you join us in this effort? And so looking at opening up vaccination sites in places of worship. Um, I know one bishop had shared with me that they opened up churches um, in um, hope of um, vaccinating uh, undocumented. This is a population that are very fearful of coming out. And with the assurance that ICE would not be present, we were able to look at um, providing vaccines for undocumented persons. So um, I'm also pleased to say that CHA is one of the founding members of the Biden administration's um, COVID-19 Community Corps. And that is a, a national effort of looking at how to get the message out. And, um, you know, we joined in and are utilizing a lot of our uh, media work that we had already put together in um, hopes of spreading the message. And, you know, it, it's funny, people will ask me and they say, well, you know, what, what do you do in, in you know, uh, spreading the word? Information is only one thing. I think as we start to um, grapple more and more with um, movement toward herd immunity and we bump up against these uh, resistance, I think we're going to have to look at some behavioral changes. And it, it often fascinates me that we use um, all sorts of analytics to target populations when we're trying to sell them a certain brand of cereal. Well, I you know, and I'm very pleased that I know one of our health systems, Bon Secours Mercy, has been using some of this type of activity and behavior in doing similar um, um, uh, methodologies in getting out to populations in need. So more to come. Hopefully, we'll see some success in these ventures. Thank you. Um, you know, all of us knew, or most of us knew, for decades that racism and health disparities has always been a public health crisis. COVID revealed this in the starkest of terms. Yeah. Tell us about this wonderful program that CHA has implemented calling, called Confronting Racism by Achieving Health Equity, the initiative that you and your members are leading, and I hope the whole world um, joins in. <laughs> Thank you. It, thank, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rhoda. I'm I'm really, really pleased about the work um, on this particular activity of CHA. And and if I may just tell you how it came to being, I think it's it's interesting. Um, as um, many of us did with our boards uh, last spring, we pivoted and started doing uh, virtual board meetings in April. And we were in the process of developing a new strategic plan. So, you know, as a new CEO, not only did I was dealing with COVID, I was dealing with a new strategic plan, trying to develop that in the midst of all this. And so we had come so far, our hope was to get the plan approved at our April board meeting and then bring it to our membership in June. Um, our board um, was very wise in saying, uh, we cannot accept a plan that was developed pre-COVID. You know, we have to remain in conversation, reflect what is happening, and discern where do we need to go. So we start meeting monthly, virtually. And it was later in the summer that we were, you know, beginning to put some um, um, meat on the bones, if you will, about this plan, that um, it was shortly after the um, killing of George Floyd. And our country was certainly in such unrest and the violence that had ensued. And our board, um, you know, spoke up and said, you know, we cannot be, you know, idle in this. We have got to do something. What is ours to do, basically, is what the board was asking. So it was at that June board meeting, they became very impassioned and said, we have to look at the work we can do to confront racism. And ours is about achieving health equity. So that really was the genesis for the beginning of this project. And so we developed a framework for a pledge. And Rhoda, I'm, I'm thrilled to say that we have over 85% of our members who have signed on the pledge and agreed to look at um, four pillars. And, and we will work collectively as um, an association with our members in helping this. But the first certainly is COVID. How do we look at um, getting um, supplies, 
testing vaccines into communities of color, communities of need. So um, a major, major focus continue right off the bat was on COVID. The second is looking at our relationship with minority communities and communities of color. You know, we pride ourselves in the work we do in community health, but, you know, what is our relationship with those communities and how do we work with them? How do we work in solidarity? You know, quite often, it's been my experience in my early history, we often come in and tell people what to do instead of working with them and asking them, what is it that you need of us? And so the shift in that mentality, we, we realize that it will help us develop stronger relationships and relationships of trust. The third pillar is really, um, I think we all have to be attentive to this, is getting our own house in order, right? So we can't talk about health equity when we have pockets of um, you know, uh, discrimination, um, areas around how we hire, um, how we recruit, um, looking at the um, you know, complexity of our boards and our senior leadership teams, and we lack diversity. And so we're going through a program with all our members, and many have already been involved in this, but it will only strengthen it to say, if we're gonna do good work here, we have to be able to do our own internal work. And um, just a side note, I'm pleased to say that even CHA with our own employees, we have kicked off a program starting actually this month, um, working on this very thing that um, our 70 plus employees will be going through in the development of a DEI program and really look at unconscious bias. Um, the fourth pillar of this pledge is, um, surprisingly, you would know this, um, you know, on advocacy, looking at legislation and policies that actually um, have been, um, you know, contributing to systemic racism, and what can we do to change the systems that certainly have oppressed people of color. So this pledge is something um, I've been talking a lot about. I've had a um, meeting with the board this morning. I had a meeting yesterday morning, and, and every opportunity I get, you know, to, to tell people what we're doing. I'm even talking with other um, heads of um, healthcare associations and saying, you know, I know many of them are doing similar type of work, but you know, what would it mean for us to come together as a collective voice in healthcare in this country and elevate it even further? And back to the collaboration you had mentioned earlier, Rhoda, I think is gonna be so important for the success of this project. You know, let's stay on advocacy for a second. Most of us know that without the Catholic Health Association, we would have never had the passage of the ACA. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people worked on it, but, but CHA really made it possible for it to be passed and for millions of our fellow human beings to have access to health care. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other things that you're looking toward that we need to do in this country to realize the dream and make it a reality of what you're trying to do? Yes. You know, um, I, I certainly want to shout out to my predecessor, Sister Carol Kean, who had a very, very strong role in leading that for the association at that time. And, um, you know, we used to have conversations about this that, you know, it's not perfect. There's more work that needs to be done. So we knew the job wasn't over. And so when I came into this role, it became very clear that, you know, um, access is one issue, but we have to look at affordability. So um, you may have health insurance, but if you can't afford your premiums, if you can't afford your co-pays, and if you're making choices about your rent and whether or not you know you can pay your deductible, I, you know that's a major issue. And so there's a, a lot of work that needs to be done in looking at bringing costs down. Um, you know, we've been talking about prescription drug pricing for a long time that needs to be under control. Um, so I would say much of this right now is going to be on um, making health care accessible and affordable. So uh, looking at Medicaid expansion, we've talked so much about that. Um, you know, the, the, the subsidies on the marketplace have been very helpful that have come in play, you know, with the passage of the American Rescue Plan. So we're pleased about that. Um, there's a lot more work to be done in that area. I would also say I'm going back to health equity. 
You know, I'm very pleased that the Biden administration has developed an office on health equity and has elevated the importance of this role. So there's going to be tremendous work for us to do in that area. Um, I think maternal and child health is another area that we're going to see more and more importance. Um, you know, pregnant women continuing coverage. We're pleased postpartum. And, um, you know, I, I often think about the impact COVID is having on children. You know, we've talked a lot about long-term care and, and um, others and, and certainly the long haulers and what that will mean in terms of chronic care services and palliative care and in the future. But we have yet to really fully appreciate the impact from, um, I think, a psychosocial perspective that all this social distancing and mask wearing will have on children. And so my real um, um, fear is, what um, the great tsunami we're going to see in the coming years of mental and behavioral health issues relative to children, and uh, and that relates even to you know um, crisis around uh, um, increasing rates of suicide. You know, it's interesting. We have DEI, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion. We really need DEIA, diversity, equity, inclusion, access, affordability, mm-hmm. and you made me think of that. Um, that we need to add an A because what good is it? I came from a community in Detroit that, you know, what good is it if people don't have access and affordability? So, uh, you know, I hope your message gets everywhere. And I have to tell you, the Love Thy Neighbor, um, we shared it with our group of 110 health systems. And these were not Catholic and everybody was picking it up. And we're also, it was maybe it was the best way to describe what we should be doing during COVID and beyond. You talked about children. Um, One of the issues that we found is that long-term care also, on the other end of the spectrum, it's been severely challenged by COVID. Patients have suffered not only from the virus, but the isolation that was caused by quarantines. What have been some of the learnings for those who are caring for our friends, our neighbors, our parents, and our grandparents? Yeah, yeah, it it is such a sad situation, and I think it just brings you to tears to see, you know, um, elderly people who are alone, who are dying alone, and the the pain of separation from their families. It's hard enough being institutionalized, if you will, but then to have to be separated um, and not have any personal interaction. So during the time, I heard from many of our, um, you know, long-term care providers saying that they were able to um, utilize, again, technology to try to bridge the gap using iPads and Zoom in order to keep families connected. Um, Many many staff would look at doing more one-on-one with individuals who really had no one, so they were having that personal interaction with a staff member and um, other sorts of things, creative things to do that, you know, bring a little light and life to their day, whether it be, you know, um, you know, having people outside the window or or dogs visiting and any anything that gives them some freshness of interaction. Um, But I I think what, again, like with health equity, um, there were so many issues around long term care that were pre COVID. You know, when we look at uh, basically long-term care being funded through Medicaid primarily, um, that's a challenge. It pays so little, and therefore it has an impact on the level of staffing. Um, you know, the wages are there paid for those workers, and we saw that happening with many of them were fearful of their own lives would leave. And I had one CEO tell me that their um, 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 providers helped out in a long-term care facility in the community. It wasn't theirs to come in and help with staffing because they had staff who wouldn't come in to care for the patients. So that that was a, a, a you know a, a really a great sadness. So I think we've got a lot to do around looking at long-term care and changes that will be needed in order to. Um, you know, improve the state of our, you know, wisdom figures of our, you know, families and our communities. And I think it's important. We owe that to them. And um, I would say also that I've been doing some reading. um, This goes back to not only long-term care, but supportive care services. 
as we talk about um, COVID and um, the impact that COVID will, you know, those who have tested positive, we, we have yet to realize the long-term impact. And we're recognizing that, you know, it's going to be considered a chronic disease. And so Catholic healthcare has always been uh, very strong in palliative care and supportive services. And I was with a group of palliative care um, um, providers recently, and we were having conversation around this very thing saying, Again, there's going to be, you know, this this wealth of um, um, a growing swell of people in need of supportive services because of that. I really appreciate you talking about services for children, services for the elderly, services for chronic disease, people with chronic disease, because it's every day of their lives. You live with it. And it means so much. You know, this last year has been like no other, especially for those of us in healthcare. What stood out the most to you, and how has it changed you as a leader? Mm. Boy, there's been a lot. Let me just say that. But, um, you know, I, I think the, um, the one line that keeps coming back to me through all this is um, something I learned years ago in the School of Social Work. And um, it's a line that the presenting problem is never the problem. And um, in many ways, I'm not trying to say COVID's a problem. I don't want to um, minimize the impact that it has had. But I think um, it has, again, how we started this conversation, it has revealed so much to us. And, you know, you put COVID aside and you start seeing the inequities in health care. You start seeing the inequities in senior care, all, all that we need to be attentive to. And with that, I will also say that um, it revealed a lot of good. And I think that as we saw people who were rising to the occasion, um, you know, great tenacity, their commitment, their um, um, a lack of, um, you know, self-regard as they cared for someone else, it really spoke volumes to the resiliency of the human spirit and what we're capable of doing and what, be, what we've done. And, you know, I, I pray about that and reflect about that. And I, you know, try to take that to heart because I'm not at a hospital right now. I'm not coming face to face with patients, but what is that learning done for me? And, you know, I, I think it has caused me to, you know, pause perhaps and look a little deeper into those situations. And um, instead of being held captive by the tyranny of the urgent that I, um, take in other perspectives, I check out my assumptions, and, and have to look more broadly in terms of saying what is really happening here and what do we need to do. And I, I think as it has revealed so much, I think it, um, you know, it, it also has revealed, you know, what is the goodness in this? And for me, and maybe it's because of my own faith commitment, I think that ultimately that good will be um, you know, what we will achieve. So those are just some of the meanderings around reflections. There's a lot to be, um, you know, uh, yet revealed in terms of what our personal learnings will be with COVID. You know, it's interesting. Um, you taught me a lot today. Um, you taught me that, you know, for those of us who've been in healthcare forever, and I love the fact that your background is so diverse, education, social services, healthcare. I think it makes an enormous difference. And it's, and what I've kind of learned is that, that we can never look at a patient mm -hmm. as someone with a cancerous tumor or a broken hip or a, a, a broken heart, but as a human person that's attached to us through family, their work, their spirituality, their attitudes, their emotion, their lives, where they live, how they live, yes. and how they get access to services. I have to say that, that, you know, that I think it was providential. You're coming to us to lead Catholic healthcare and healthcare in America mm -hmm. at the time it happened. It is, you are amazing. It's a blessing to be able to talk to you today. And, and I can't wait to see what's next for you and for CHA. And thank you so much for the time today. 
Rhoda, thank you so much. I'm humbled by your words, and um, I often sit back and reflect on what is what is this all about, you know, and what is God calling us to? And I believe that it's the work we do collectively, people like you, you know, calling us together in these important moments and reflect deeper upon what is happening. So I'm honored and I'm touched. Thank you very much. Thank you, sister, for your time. <laughs>